What's up you guys and welcome to Andy's Playground. I'm your host as always Andy and today is the 100th video on Andy's Playground. I know I haven't been very active lately on the channel and I'm hoping that's going to change with some new projects that I'm working on lately. Um, but I thought just to kind of celebrate for the 100th video I've ever produced on my channel, I think it would be fun to kind of go back and go back to the first video I ever made um, just to kind of react to it, maybe tell some fun facts about the video that you guys might not know of. Just because this first video I've ever made um, was 100% different from the rest of the content I've ever made. Um, it's the one and only uh, Secrets and Histories uh, video I've ever done. I was planning on doing more of these um, when I was creating these at the time, but, but yeah, that's the plan for today. So I hope you guys enjoy this video, and let's get into it. So before we actually get into the video itself, I want to kind of explain some background about this. So I created this channel um, during one of the roughest periods of my life. I was going through a divorce at the time, I was um, really struggling in a lot of different aspects of my life, and one of the things that kept me kind of going was the idea that I really wanted to work at Disney. I really wanted to work for Disney. Um, that just seemed like this big goal um, off in the future that was right for me. Um, and at the time I was watching a lot of Disney YouTubers. My favorites at the time were Justin Scard, um, Fresh Baked Disney, um, as they were called back then, now they're called Fresh Baked, um, and then Offhand Disney. And one thing that they all three had in common was they did these really cool secrets and history videos um, about rides or aspects or anything like that. And I thought, you know what, that's so cool. I, I love the level of detail. I wonder if I could do something like that. You know, get footage from somewhere, put it into a video, do some history on it, write down my own little thoughts, and then make a video with uh, some jokes in it. Um, and then hopefully it would be fun and entertaining. Um, that was the goal at least. <laughs> and um, I think for a while, um, I realized after doing this one video where it took me several weeks of writing, filming, editing, um, I was like, this is tough, but I'll wait till I get back to Disney World um, before I do anything else again. Fast forward to now, I haven't come out with another one since, so here we are. So let's get down into the video itself. Have you ever wondered why Disney chose to build a water-based attraction based on a controversial Disney movie? Also, I'm recording this entire thing on my computer, like this computer actually. Um, all the audio, um, music and everything, yeah, that, that's on this computer. I didn't even have a camera at that time. Have you ever been curious about why that same water ride is right next to the most haunted and scariest attraction Disneyland has to offer? And how did they get the idea of a water-based attraction from a movie that doesn't have a lot of water in it? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the very first oh episode boy. of Andy's Playground. I'm your host as always, Andy, and today we're going to be looking at a particular personal favorite attraction of mine, Splash Mountain. So that shirt, I still have that shirt. I was actually planning on trying to wear that shirt, but it was the wrong humor coat shirt I was wearing. That's one of the original ones. Um, but ever since that video, I was just like, you know what, a humor coat is still one of my favorite things that I was ever a part of. Um, might as well just keep wearing those shirts. Also, I really liked my hairstyle in that video, um, and I've tried to recreate that a couple of times, but I think it was just because I was just super tired. You can actually see bags under my eyes, I was so dang tired. Um, I was also a lot skinnier back then, that was funny. Um, I was going through a very stressful time period, of course, but fun fact, the music in the background is all done by me, minus the drums. I, w I worked in garage band and I had my acoustic guitar, um, and I was literally playing um, two different tracks of um, Zippity Doo Dah and I think some other things too, we'll see. We're going to be covering a brief history of everyone's favorite laughing place and hopefully answering some questions many of you have had along the way. We'll mostly be focusing on the Disneyland Resort version of the attraction since it's the original, but I'll try to include some facts about the other versions as well. So first up, I want to tell you all a little story called Disney's Song of the South. Ooh, trigger warning. Man, I'm so funny. <laughs> Song of the South was produced by Walt Disney in 1946 and takes place during the Reconstruction era of the United States, shortly after the Civil War. It starred individuals like James Basket as Uncle Remus, who also voiced one of the crows in Dumbo. That's Bob true. Bob Driscoll as Johnny, who later went on to voice Peter Pan in Disney's animated feature. Also true. Here's a fun fact that you didn't know. Yeah. Anyways, to be brief, the story showcases Uncle Remus teaching Johnny several life lessons about running away, not getting involved with things you shouldn't be, and finding ways to be happy in tough times. Each story being told through the characters of Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Bear, and Br'er Fox, just to name a few. Being from the South, I could go on and on with my thoughts on this movie, but I would stray away from the point of the video. 
Yeah, that was probably like, uh, I didn't go into my thoughts. I actually like the movie as a whole, like the messages that it's trying to tell, but obviously there's a lot of racial overtones in the movie that um, it, it's, it's, it's difficult for a lot of people to watch this movie because it, in film at the time, in the 1930s uh, and 40s and 50s, in that kind of era of film, um, black people were treated such in, in disrespectful and not necessarily the best manners. I don't know, it, it's just such a difficult thing to look at now and looking back on it and it's just I understand so much more about it. Um, as a whole, I think I still liked it. I think what they could do if they ever wanted to re-release it, Warner Brothers does this all the time with their cartoons um, that are from that kind of time period. They like put a little placard over it that this is like um, showcasing views and statements that are not true to this day or whatever, blah, blah, blah or like not portrayed correctly. Um, or they could just redo it. I mean, that's another alternative. Uh, and then do it right. Um, it might be darker, um, but that's, a, that's another alternative, I guess. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the beautiful portrayal of Uncle Remus by James Baskin. 100%. Yes, it's a controversial movie, but when I think of this movie and this ride itself, I can't help but picture this amazing and wise character done by an even more charming and amazing actor. He really Anyways, is. Personally, I think the movie has a lot of great points, but like I said, and as many people know, it was very controversial for a number of reasons. Due to all of the surrounding circumstances with all the controversial reasons here, Disney banned and retconned the film for public release in 1986, and pretty much all you can find nowadays is bootleg copies online or old VHS tapes. I actually was at my library in Chicago, and I had to order it from the city of Chicago. Um, it was like a special VHS tape, and that was the only reason I was able to watch it was through my library system. Song of the South and the characters contained therein were off to their own briar patches and laughing places. However, ah. three years before Disney retconned all of the copies of Song of the South, an amazing and well-known Imagineer by the name of Tony Baxter, yeah. who was famous for rides like Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, came up with the idea of a log flume ride in an area known as Bear Country at the time, which according to an article from the LA Times, was only attracting 2% of park goers on a busy day. Think about how many guests go into the park on a daily basis, and imagine just 2% of that in Bear Country. Kind of crazy. Not a lot of people. The idea was to create an attraction that could cover three major problems. Bring more guests over to the Country Bear Jamboree Rest and peace. Bear Country in general. <laughs> Reuse animatronics from America Sings, which was an attraction located in tomorrow. That's a cool Island attraction. Song for attendance issues. And number three, overcoming a too original idea of a log flip concept. Yeah. You see that last one? Show that even back then, Disney Imagineers were more focused on being innovative. And a log flip concept was something that practically every single amusement park had. I'm they so passionate. The original. They Look at this. To be the log flip concept <laughs> never even seen before. I'm so animated with my hands and stuff like that. I don't know, wild mouse coaster that every theme park and state fair has. Oh! Uh, Legoland has one of those too. Baxter since they included a southern charm and loads of woodland animals. Something that would be perfect right next to the Country Bear Jamboree. But it's still an interesting concept that Disney retconned the movie the ride would be based on a year before the construction began. That's crazy. And retconned or not, construction did begin with an eventual whopping budget of $75 million. The title of the ride planned on being known as Sippity Doodah River Run. To put that in perspective, Disneyland itself cost about $17 million. Based on an inflation calculator, $17 million in 1955 would cost about $70 to $72 million in 1987. Add another $3 million on there, and you could have yourself a very on Splash Mountain. They literally stated that you could build another park to what it cost to build Splash Mountain. Now, one interesting thing a lot of you may not realize is the fact that other than the occasional river or two, Song of the South doesn't contain a heck of a lot of water, so how did Disney executives solve that problem? According to the Disney Wiki page and the Disney Parks blog, a moonshining raccoon named Rackety made a slight but disastrous error. While mixing an experimental batch of moonshine, his juice-producing setup ended up exploding and being blown sky high. Apparently, Rackety had built his juice still in the woods that backed up to the dam of an industrious Beaver Brothers crew, which burst the dam and flooded the whole valley and all the tunnels within Chickapin Hill. Not many people know that story. That's pretty crazy. You know? Now, it's kind of an interesting story with not a lot of references to any major Disney characters, so it could or could not be true. 
but it's better than Michael Eisner's idea of focusing around the movie starring Tom Hanks in a scaly clad mermaid called Splash, which I'm, I'm sure all of you have heard about. So I was doing a dig at the movie at the time, but I actually came to find out that was actually a huge hit. Um, and it's actually on Disney Plus now. Um, and <coughs> it was one of their bigger hits. Um, I still haven't seen it, um, but I, I, I apologize to the movie creators for giving it a hit, especially when it probably actually is a, it's an actual box office hit. So, Anyways, the name Splash kind of stuck, and so it became Splash Mountain. Let's take a brief break and talk about the schematics of the Splash Mountain ride itself. The ride itself is a 9 to 10 minute log flume ride through caverns and caves with critters all over the place and stands 87 feet tall. There are over 100 audio animatronic critters that call Splash Mountain home. The majority of which I'm not going to lie, I actually really like all the footage that I've been using here. I definitely put a lot of good work and effort into this one. The ride itself contains well over 475,000 gallons of water and pumps out 20,000 gallons per minute. And of course contains the 32 and a half foot drop that has a decline of 47 degrees with a speed of 40 miles per hour. At the time of its creation, it was the largest flume shoot of its kind. Some of the funnier things that occurred during the making of the Song of the South creation so animated. was the ride worked a little too low. In the sense that early riders, who were sometimes made up of Disney executives, were getting way too wet on the ride. And in my opinion, to imagine Disney executives wearing suits riding Splash Mountain, is a really funny image in my head. Anyways, to fix the issue, they made the boats lighter by making sure the weight of each boat weighs a certain amount before launching. This, among other issues, caused Splash Mountain to open later than scheduled, but it finally did open on July 17th, 1989, 34 years exactly that Disneyland opened. When Splash Mountain opened... That video, the opening day video, is hilarious, too. The ride, especially in the drop, and the ride soon began living up to the name that Disney executives were giving it called Cash Mountain. Hey! Michael Eisner got those dollar sign eyes that you see in cartoons. More funny and graphics. Three years later, both the Magic Kingdom and Walt Disney World and Tokyo Disneyland both received the Splash Mountain, each opening a day after the other. The Magic Kingdom version being much larger with a 950,000 gallon water reservoir, and the Tokyo version having an even larger drop. As for Disneyland, Bear Country was renamed Critter Country, and it's stuck to this day, which makes perfect sense since the only bears you see there nowadays are Rare Bear and Winnie the Pooh. Another dig here because I absolutely loved Disneyland's Country Bear Jamboree. I have a lot of fond memories of it and I was heartbroken one day when we went to the park and it was closed because they're going to make room for Winnie the Pooh. Especially after, shortly before that, we had gone to Disney World and Mr. Toad's Wild Ride had been replaced by Winnie the Pooh. So I'm like, dang it Winnie the Pooh, you've killed two of my favorite attractions. But it's okay because I still love Winnie the Pooh. So <laughs> that was rough though, I remember that. From what I've heard, one person who didn't exactly like the ride itself was Imagineer Mark Davis. Mark was famous for creating an improvement ride such as Pirates of the Caribbean, Jungle Cruise, and American This is Series. true. According to his wife, Alice Davis, Mark was actually very upset about the ride and the fact that they were using the animatronics that he designed for the closing America Sinks attraction, and they instead used them in Splash Mountain. And in consequence, he actually never went on Splash Mountain. I think that's such a sad story, and um... I found that out in a documentary, um, Alice Davis was talking about um, Mark Davis's um, experience in life with um, Splash Mountain, and I thought that was so sad because um, he's such this, you know, brilliant uh, designer, Imagineer, um, you know, he worked on the Jungle Cruise and all these different things, but he was just so upset that they took animatronics, like, didn't really change them up all that much. They took the animatronics that he designed and built for this attraction that he really did like, America Sings. And then because America Sink wasn't as popular, they just literally just repurposed them into the other ride. Now I wonder, you know, that's not a bad thing. You know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, parks get redesigned all the time, but you never really understand like the, uh, or hear from like the Imagineers who originally designed the ride. Like, um, for instance, when a great movie ride was going to get changed into Mickey's Runaway Railway, I heard a couple stories about some Imagineers, but not to like this extent. Like this is someone who like was asked by Walt to design certain rides like Jungle Cruise and stuff like that make him funnier and then he puts his work into America Sink which he was very proud of and then just to see it get not destroyed but move to a different location um like I, I can understand like he'd be upset but I, I also at the time I don't know I feel grateful that at least my work or at least some of my work would be placed into another area so that way it would always be remembered now when this ride gets reimagined again um which I had no idea of at the time of course when I made the video in 2018 um I wonder 
if they're going to keep those animatronics again, and that way they're able to keep going. I'm sure they will, but it was just kind of sad. That was one of the sadder facts I learned about this video. However, people would tell him that Splash Mountain seemed to be a fitting place for the critters, and that the writing exactly. felt that it carried the memory of America Sings. Mm -hmm. America Sings is its own kind of faded attraction, and extinct attraction, which I think would be a lot of fun to talk about on this channel. But for now, let's keep going to Splash Mountain. That's one of the few times in this video that that's actually me. That, that, the way I talk like that, that's, that, that was me at the time. Like, I, that, I'm that kind of a person. Um, that's my actual voice. It's not me trying to do someone else. That's one of the things I noticed with this video. I'm like, I'm trying to be someone else in this video sometimes. Personally, I feel that the theming of Song of the South is an interesting choice. But based on the characters contained therein, I couldn't think of a better Southern concept that would have better solved the issues that Disney executives were facing. Not to mention that they made an amazing ride with what they have. When I look at Splash Mountain today, and I'm sure the same goes for many guests and probably you, I don't remember Song of the South in the sense of what the movie was about. I look at it for its characters and charm, which frankly is what Disney executives were going for. However, I encourage you guys to check out Song of the South. If anything but to see the background behind these characters and stories. They do teach a powerful lesson, and I think all of us can benefit. I, I still can stand by, I believe that everyone should see Song of the South at least once, just to understand why it is what it is. Um, why um, it's as controversial as it is. Um, why you're probably not going to see much of it in the parks. Um, at the same time though too, I, and of course we had no idea that Splash Mountain was going to be rethemed because, and or Zippity Doo Dah would be taken out, or anything like that. Um, but I, I can just completely uh, say that I feel like they they wanted to just take the characters, just take the characters of Song of the South, like the animated characters of Song of the South and put them in its own attraction and its own entity to separate it because it's not, it's not anything Song of the South related. It still has some, one of the core messages of Song of the South, but it's not the message. So I don't know about, what did I say? It's an amazing ride with what they have. When I look at Splash Mountain today, and I'm sure the same goes for many guests and probably you, I don't remember Song of the South in the sense of what the movie was about. I look at it for its characters and charm, which frankly is what Disney executives were going for. I don't know. I, I feel like they were trying to also tell some of that story in there too. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Song of the South is one of those territories it's very difficult to talk about. Um, but I think in this whole, like, the characters definitely fit the ride, for sure. However, I encourage you guys to check out Song of the South. If anything but to see the background behind these characters and stories, they do teach a powerful lesson, and I think all of us can benefit. Splash Mountain is one of my favorite rides, and it's many others' favorites too. But what do you guys think? I want to hear your opinions too. Leave a comment down below. I can't wait to see what you guys think. And as always, stay positive, my friends. Well, it's time to be moving along. Let me know what you guys want me to look into next, whether they be attractions or rides or whatever, and I'll dig into it. Leave a like and subscribe if you like this video and you want to see more. See you next time and have a zippity doo dah day. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> that ending, though. I, I can tell it was like my fifth take on that one probably. That one took a while because I was just so frustrated. Like, well, <laughs> that's just so funny. And then this end card right here. This was for like several of my first videos. I don't know why. I, I was getting copying what I saw other people doing, especially for like Fresh Baked. Look at the freaking Andes right here on the top left and then top right is Playground. That's just so funny. Oh my gosh. And also, I think that's one of the only times I've ever said please like and subscribe to a video of mine. Like, I never really ask you guys to do that just because if you want to, you can you can do it if you want to. I don't. I, it doesn't bother me. I'm not trying to make a career off of YouTube. This is just something I do for fun. Hey guys. So one of the things I will be doing with each one of these videos is a little shout out to a channel that really means a lot to me. Or okay, so the shout out. So this is something I really did like doing at the time because I was like, I, I want to give back to the people that gave to me. Um, I think this one was Sorry, off Disney. So that you guys can go see their stuff too. Yes. For my first shout out, I decided to do it for the guy who really inspired me to make all of these videos. Offhand Disney is by far one of my favorite people to watch. Offhand Disney, or Dallin Smith, is a brilliant and funny Disney nerd where he dives into all kinds of theories and Disney history. His style of videos is very close to what mine are geared to be, and I just have a ton of respect for what he does. My favorite video of his is linked in the description below, and it's about a major Disney theory I personally believe in called 
the Gene Lafitte theory, as he calls it, which links the Haunted Mansion, Pirates of the That's Caribbean, so funny. Tom Sawyer, I love that video. and other Disneyland stuff together. It's really funny and crazy, and I just encourage you guys to check him out. Dallin, if you ever see this video for some reason, which you please wouldn't. know that I'm a big fan of your work, and I look forward to seeing more of it in the future. Thanks for the inspiration, and have a great day, everyone. Nice. I also like the idea when I was saying be positive at the end of the video too. I think that was really, really good. Um, I, I was all about the cluster positivity as well from Justin's card. Still am. Um, but it, it, it's just, you know, one of those things that are really funny. Um, as a whole, I definitely think this video is a product of its time for my channel. Um, in the sense that I was really looking forward to doing some kind of secrets and history videos and stuff like that about the Disney parks and stuff like that because I'm very passionate about the parks. I'm very passionate about learning everything I can about a ride, everything I can about an experience. Um, but as its whole, um, it's one of those things where I definitely um, realize I bit off more than I can chew and I can see why people like Dallin or Fresh Baked or even Justin Scarred um, take a lot of time with these videos because it takes a lot of effort and time uh, coming up with history videos and also making sure that they're quality. Um, one of the things I learned from this video was that I wanted to make my videos a little bit better quality wise. Um, that's why I bought a camera. That's why I bought a microphone for the camera. That's why I bought um, a better uh, recording devices like my iPhone or anything like that that I can use for audio purposes or anything like that and sometimes um, the audio quality or the video quality is still not that good um, and I get frustrated about it I have a lot of um, anxiety about some of the stuff that I release and this was a good example of me just trying to put something out there like something I was very passionate something that took me a long time to make um, something where I could channel all my love of Disney stuff and it put it into a video I was recording this in a little studio music room um, at BYU Idaho, um, where you typically play piano. Like there's, it's like a noise canceling room, and it was the quietest place on campus. Um, and I was probably the only person in the building at the time. Um, and it, it was just, I can still remember like everything I was feeling when I was recording. I can still see like all the frustration on my face. Um, I can still see myself not necessarily being myself, but trying to be one of those other YouTubers. And I'm so grateful that since that time period, um, of August 27th, 2018, whenever I uploaded this video, um, I've learned so much about how important it is to just be yourself when it comes to making YouTube videos. Um, because it's so easy to come up with a persona or come up with something that you're not and try to justify it as who you are. Um, and you can get burnt out of that really, really quickly. Um, I still see certain videos of some of my idols and stuff like that, like Justin and Fresh Baked and Offhand Disney, but I don't watch them as much as I used to. Um, I watch other people um, now every now and then, but for the most part, YouTube has become this place where it's so easy to get burnt out if you're doing the same thing over and over, or if you're trying to copy someone else, or if you're trying to be someone you're not. Um, and that's just a sad fact because you want to make sure YouTube is about you. Like, what is the thing that you want to produce? What is the thing you want to create on YouTube? And that's difficult for a lot of people because they don't know what it is. So for me, um, I'm grateful that I had this experience where I was able to see this is fun, but this is also tough. But overall, guys, um, and this video is quite long already, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for standing along for this entire journey here. Um, this video um, is the untold story of Splash Mountain, Andy's Playground, Secrets in History, episode number one. It has 140 views on my channel right now, and there's so many um, episodes and uh, videos on my channel that have gotten way more views than that um, because I've understood that it's important to just be you. You know, if there's one thing I can pass on from this after 100 videos on YouTube um, is to just be yourself and embrace who you are because who you are is awesome. And you can create the kind of content that you want to create. You can do the things you want to do. Um, it's okay to just be yourself and accept that. And if you don't want to upload regularly like I do, like I have a, such a sporadic um, upload schedule now where I can, I'm, it's lucky if I upload, um, you know, once a month. <laughs> Um, but, you know, there, there's so many different things you can do, and uh, I'm just grateful for all of you guys for following me on this journey. But until next time, guys, I'll see you real soon.